I am going to talk today about the new, new ACCHA 2020 valve guidelines. So this came out in 2020. Um, it was an update to the complete 2014 guidelines, which I think many of us were familiar. There was a 2017 update as well. And if any, I'm sure all of us have tried to go through these documents. They're quite hefty, a lot of tables, um, a lot of references. So I'm hoping to break it down pretty quickly, probably highlight some of the things that we will be talking about later on in more detail. Um, and just kind of hit the highlights for us so we can go over some of the newer changes and some of the things that have stayed the same over the last few years. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about were the disease stages. So this is here to stay. So they still recommend our staging for aortic stenosis and they break it down into an A, B, C, D staging, much like many of our stages. So A is our patients at risk, our patients with risk factors for development of um, valvular heart disease or rheumatic disease, things like that. Um, stage B is progressive. So patients with progressive valvular heart disease maybe are mild to moderate severity. Generally asymptomatic patients would be in this stage B. Our stage C is our asymptomatic severe. So these are our patients who are meeting criteria for severe valvular heart disease, which I'm sure we'll be talking about more in the future here. Um, and they are further divided into a C1 and C2 category. Our C1 patients are the asymptomatic patients who have severe valvular disease or severe aortic stenosis, um, where the left ventricle and the right ventricle are still compensated. So normal EF, normal RV function. Our C2 patients are the asymptomatic patients with our severe aortic stenosis, but who have had decompensation of their EF. And they define that as less than 50% or decompensation of the right ventricle. Um, and then finally is our stage D, which we'll talk a little bit more in, um, in the future here. But those are our patients who now have symptoms as a result of their severe uh, aortic stenosis. Um, the, the guidelines do highlight um, our anticoagulation for our patients with valvular heart disease for atrial fibrillation, um, especially with our bioprosthetic valves. Before, I know many of us, um, there was a contraindication or a question of whether or not valvular heart disease counted um, for our use of our NOACs or DOACs um, with our bioprosthetic, but the valve guidelines this time say definitely if you've got atrial fibrillation and a bioprosthetic aortic valve, uh, a novel anticoagulant, so our Xarelto, our Eliquis, is an effective alternative to Coumadin. However, they do recommend we still should be applying our CHADS FAST score um, to help us determine whether or not it is indicated. Um, however, as, as previously, as most of us know, NOACs should still not be used with aortic mechanical prosthesis with or without atrial fibrillation. And I know I'm talking about the aortic valve, but just to put it out there, for um, mitral valve, bioprosthetic mitral valves were placed, placed for rheumatic mitral stenosis, we're still recommending using a, uh, a Coumadin or Warfarin for those. So it's not yet, no or DOAC is not yet um, approved for that. So next, the guidelines do recommend we use a heart valve team, which is what we've got here, which is fantastic. Um, so all patients with severe aortic stenosis being considered for intervention should be evaluated by a multidisciplinary heart valve team. I know we're going to hear a lot more about that today. Um, and I think that, I know for my practice, we practice in a rural area. Uh, we don't have a lot of resources, but having the resources of that valve team here where we can pick up the phone and talk to the valve team, get some answers, and where they just help us with our patients from a multidisciplinary um, level is so helpful for cardiac cardiologists practicing in the community, and we really see the best care for our patients. So I think that the guidelines support what we've set up here for Piedmont, and that is great for all of our patients. So going back to our stages, so um, it further, the guidelines further uh, divide us up into these stage D categories, which I know that we're going to go into in more detail later, so I'll just kind of highlight it. So we've got our D1, our D2, and our D3. This is a busy slide. But basically our D1 are our, our, our symptomatic severe patients with high gradient AS. These are kind of our slam dunks. Their mean gradient is greater than 40. Their Vmax is greater than 4. They have um, definite uh, severe aortic stenosis. They are symptomatic and they would definitely benefit from valve replacement. Our D2 stages and D3 are a little bit more esoteric. So we have our symptomatic severe, but these are our low flow, low gradient. 
aortic stenosis with reduced ejection fraction. These are the ones that can be a little bit trickier to diagnose, and I know we're going to talk about that more, but you may see severe leaflet calcification. Their valve area may be less than one centimeter, but their um, Vmax and their mean gradients are going to be less than our severe categories. And um, then our D3 are also our symptomatic severe low flow, low gradient with normal EF and paradoxical low flow severe AS. And again, we may see severe leaflet calcification, but, um, but their stroke volume index is going to be lower and it can be harder to diagnose. Now, thankfully, the, um, the guidelines do highlight some things that can help us to uh, diagnose these patients. Dobutamine stress tests can be used for these low flow, low gradients, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, but it can be um, useful to measure the aortic velocity and valve area at baseline and then higher flow rates and can help definitively diagnose these patients. And if severe, our velocity should increase to that greater than four millimeters, four meters per second with that aortic valve area staying less than one centimeters. Aortic calcification is also talked about in the, in the valve lines to help us diagnose these patients. Um, we do this, I know as I do a lot of CT, we do this a lot of in our community to help us diagnose these, but we can get a simple calcium score or this can be done with the CTs that we do here pre-procedurally. And uh, that you can actually get an Agatson score on the aortic valve. Over 1,300 in women and over 2,000 in men can correlate with severe aortic stenosis and the valve guidelines do talk about this as a good way to help diagnose those D2, D3 patients. The guidelines do talk about timing for severe aortic stenosis, which I know we'll talk about in more detail. So if we have symptoms or EF has declined less than 50%, that's a class one indication by the guidelines. If you have asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis and you're undergoing cardiac surgery for other indications, that's a C1 classification. Um, if you're asymptomatic and have low surgical risk, there's kind of several 2A, 2B indications that can be decreasing exercise tolerance or an exercise associated decrease in systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury, very severe AS where your Vmax is more than five and you're asymptomatic, a BNP more than three times normal was a class 2A indication for these asymptomatic severe AS patients according to the guidelines. And then if you have severe high gradient AS and progressive EF, so if over three serial imaging we see that EF start to decline, that can also be a reason based on the guidelines for surgery based on, the, um, based on their surgical risk. Also, I know we'll talk about this a lot, the guidelines really do highlight surgical versus transcatheter procedures for replacement. So they do highlight that surgical aortic valve replacement is preferred if you're under 65 with life expectancy more than 20 years, if your vascular anatomy precludes uh, TAVR, or if you're asymptomatic with the 2A indications, then surgical valve, surgical valvular replacement is recommended by the guidelines. TAVI is preferred by, based on the guidelines, which we'll talk about more. But more than 80 years old, life expectancy under 10 years, or symptomatic patients at any age with a high surgical risk. Um, and then we'll talk probably more about this in the future, but in that 65 to 80 year old range with no indications to a transfemoral TAVR, um, the guidelines really, really encourage um, shared decision making. And I think that's where our, our medical team approach really comes into play.